Hello, this is Dr. Mewborn, and this is Religion in the Public Square. Our topic is Christian America, Four Perspectives. Today we're looking at an outline given to us by William D. Hennard that's uh, in the book Christian America. Uh, this is a, a great outline, helps us to understand his perspective. Um, William D. Hennard uh, serves as Assistant Professor of Evangel Evangelism and Church Growth at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kentucky. Uh, and so let's go ahead and jump into our study as we look to see his essay on this matter. Um, it is entitled America Essentially Christian, and this is his conclusion at the beginning. My conclusion is simple. Since Christianity played such a vital role in the founding of the American system of government, the original intention of the signers of, of the Declaration of Independence and the authors of the Constitution was not to form a government that was free from religion, but to protect religion from the tyranny and control government. Um, this, his whole point here is to talk about um, the, the idea that Christianity was a major part in the founding of this country. Uh, he doesn't focus in on so much what it has become or what it is today, but the founding of it is it's essentially Christian um, from, the, from the beginning. And he begins by talking about John Calvin. John Calvin from 1509 to 1564. He was a French theologian, pastor and reformer, Protestant of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, the Reformed theological system of beliefs known as Calvinism was named after him. Of course, he has given us a huge book or uh, writings called the Institutes of Christian Religion. And in that work, he defines so many things that pertain to salvation, predestination. He also goes into uh, spiritual piety. He goes into uh, just the Christian behavior in life. And then he talks about, of course, government as well. But he is a person that has been looked at for the last four or five hundred years, his life, because he was so devout and he was such a, um, he wrote so much. And so it's important to, to see him. And Hennard makes this connection between John Calvin and the founding of America because this was the thinking of the people and they were getting their thinking from John Calvin and his writings. And so what, that really is what drives a, a people group. It's what they believe or what they think, and that's what Hennard is, is actually putting forth here when we look at John Calvin. John Calvin, the separation of church and state, uh, an important look at John uh, Calvin's life and work. Calvin's perspective of the relationship between church and state. Uh, what's his, this is his thoughts on this, um, his perspective. Pastors were to preach and minister sacraments. Doctors instructed believers in the faith. Elders were to provide discipline. Deacons cared for the poor and needy. And consistory five consisted of five pastors and 12 lay leaders were to oversee the church. Now, this is interesting because his mindset when he was in Geneva and he began to write, John Calvin focused a lot on that there shouldn't be really be a separation of church and state. Actually, they should work together very, very strongly and that the church should drive what the state is really doing. Because if we want to be a holy nation, if we want to be a godly people, then we have to get that holiness from somewhere. It has to come. And so it's the kingdom of God that transforms the kingdom of this world, such as um, the kingdom of heaven transforms Christians here on earth. It, it continues down, domino effect, that it actually affects um, the world as well, as, as well. And so we can make the, the world a better place. That's not just a cliche, but that's the thinking of the Puritans as well, which got their thinking from John Calvin. And so the Puritans believed they were going to usher in uh, really a truly reformed nation or uh, people of God. Actually, in some of their thinking in the Puritan church, which got their thinking from John Calvin, they believed that they were the, um, the new covenant people, that the new world America, if you want to put it, um, who became America, they believed those people 
were the actual new Israel. And they were the ones who had now received the covenants with God. And, and they were the ones who were in covenant with God. And so, so many things had changed. And so, a lot of that belief system of the Puritans came from the idea that John Calvin said, this has to work together. Um, and so, uh, as we continue in it, it says, John, Calvin's formation of church and state. The government was responsible for education, protection, and oversight of human citizenry. The church provided teaching and guidance for its members. And so he kind of separates it out a little bit. You know, the government was responsible for certain things, but the church provided teaching and the guidance for the members. So so the, the church was the one who actually had the true understanding um, of how things should be done. But the government was kind of like used as a police system or police officers um, to protect and serve. And that's just kind of their, their point, but it kind of, it comes under the church in general. But the rise of opposition came pretty quickly. Um, conflict arose in Calvin's life because of poignant attacks on unbiblical behavior. His attacks on congregants as well as magistrates could be heard during sermons and public addresses. The issue that Calvin had a lot of times was he he didn't care who he was talking to or talking about. He would speak in public places against anybody that he believed was in the wrong. And so um, this, this opposition uh, became kind of something that helped drive um, him to succeed even more. And, uh, and he just stood up for what he believed was right, um, whether or not it was right or not. He stood up for the things that he wanted to do. Uh, the next thought was the test case of Michael Servetus. This, this slide is going to be a little interesting for us if you've never heard of Michael Servetus, but Servetus underwent harsh criticism and eventual death because of his stances against certain religious teachings and interpretations. His denial of the Trinity, as well as his attack on Calvin's institutes, led to his imprisonment in Geneva. He was eventually burned at the stake for heresy. Uh, this is what's called sometimes the black guy of the Reformation. Um, John Calvin actually oversaw um, and, and supported the death of this man, Michael Servetus. Um, and, and it's a sad case because Michael Servetus is just saying what he wants to say. He might have been um, a person that was uh, a person of confrontation or conflict, but he went through the institutes and actually wrote things on the sides of it and said, hey, these are all the things that are wrong with this whole system of beliefs and 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 this is uh, this is what I feel and you're wrong to be teaching what you're teaching. Well, because of that um, and because of John Calvin's stance on on state church and and that the, the church and the government really worked together, they called for um, for the death of this man, which is a really sad thing. But um, this is the times that they were living in. And, and I see that more and more in books, but this is what was going on at the time. Um, another case, a test case of Phil, Philibert uh, Bethelier, I believe is how you say it, excommunication. This is what we know. During Calvin's life, the church needed the ability to discipline its members, but the government also wanted to speak to these issues. Bethelier fought against this and was eventually beheaded. Um, and so... Uh, just another sad, sad moment here in history as the church is working together with the government so closely and allowing things like this to happen and actually bringing forth things like this. Um, it, it's just a very, very sad case. You can read more about it in your book, Christian America. Uh, Calvin's death. Calvin was sick for many years of his life. Many thought this led to his impatience and sometimes violent temper. Uh, he married a woman who was an Anabaptist um, at the time, was a widow of an Anabaptist, actually, and um, and which I find very interesting. But um, but he married her, and she took care of him for so many years because he was his body was so frail. If you see a lot of things with the reformers and and Christian. Um, Christian authors just in the past, uh, they, there's a, these people went through a lot of issues. Uh, there wasn't medicine like we have today, so they just dealt with things. And he was uh, well taken care of by his wife, but he definitely dealt with major sicknesses. He passed away and was placed in unmarked grave in Geneva. I think that's because he was such a, um, such a confrontational type person. 
uh, and people didn't want him to be idolized, number one, and number two, to be uh, defamed in any, any way or uh, vandalized in any way. Um, the particulars of Calvin's belief in church and state, he believed that Christ should rule in all areas of life, whether civil or religious. Um, Calvin wrote about these civil ideals in the Institutes of the religious uh, re of Christian religion. Um, he believed that Christ should be the one who guides all things, whether it's spiritual uh, or it's uh, secular or it's which secular doesn't really make a lot of sense. He believes it's all Christ is ruling in all of it, so it all has a spiritual aspect to it. So it's whether civil or religious, God is ruling over those. So we cannot take him out of of any form of government. And uh, this is the belief that Hennard get, is giving us. As we move on, uh, the belief in two kingdoms. Number one, spiritual. The conscience is instructed in piety and in fearing God. And then there's political. Man is educated for the duties of humanity and citizenship. John Calvin believed that there was two separate aspects to, um, to life and to people, that there's a spiritual aspect to them, uh, that the conscience is instructed by piety and fearing God, and that's what drives that. But then there's the political side, more of a civil side, man educated, educated for the duties of humanity and citizenship. Um, the role of ecclesiastical and civil government. There's moral law, worship God with pure faith and piety, ceremonial law, the tutelage of the Jews, and judicial law given for civil government, and kind of seeing how these are laid out dealing with church and civil government. He sees these as being uh, kind of a way of thinking, uh, the way that ought to be thought even to today, uh, the way that people ought to live their lives. Um, interesting, I found this, and, and I, this must be um, this must be some kind of uh, maybe series that a church is going through, but it's called Sin in the Camp, Matthew 18, How to Handle Church Discipline. Um, William Hennard says the primary function of both church and state government was the discipline of the people. And so uh, the purpose that he believes for the church and state was to keep people in line and to guide them so that they can have good civil lives that are right with one another and right with God. That's the whole point and what he's thinking there. Um, the Puritan perspective and the settlement of America. Puritans wanted to bring reform to the Church of England. Here's the difference. And separatists wanted to separate themselves from the Church of England. And so you can see it in the in the in the name there. Uh, that the idea is those Puritans, a lot of what we think of of the people in America, they weren't trying to necessarily break off from the Church of England. They were trying to, to change it. They were trying to, um, to, to be a part of it, but fix the problems that's there within. The separatist says, no, we're just breaking off because everything about them is corrupt. It's corrupt all the time. John Winthrop and the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Winthrop, along with many others, believed that people of the New World would play a huge role in the wonderful story of God's favor on an elect nation. Ultimately, as I shared earlier, um, many people thought that the New World, um, that the colonies, um, that what we'd call is, is early America, all of that, uh, many people believed that God had a connection with these people, and they were breaking away from those who uh, had completely gone the wrong way in Christianity and in life, like the Church of England, and they broke off of that. Now they're right with God, so they're in the right covenant with God, and God's got incredible blessings for them, and He's going to bring in huge blessings uh, into this elected nation, and that's what they're thinking there. Um, the separatists of Plymouth Colony, these people believe that their souls were in danger of damnation if they continued to support or condone the Church of England in any way. They actually believe that if, if there was any kind of support or condoning of anything going on with the Church of England, their souls were uh, in danger of damnation, so they completely pulled away. John Winthrop's sermon, A Model of Christian Charity. Winthrop believed that just as God made a covenant with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, he has made covenants with the people of the New World. Moreover, the New World had the same standing 
as the Israelites. And a lot of people believe this. And this, sometimes you would say this kind of falls into the category of replacement theology that the church, um, the church age, the church since Christ came and, and since the apostles and all that, we are in um, that the church has taken over and replaced all of the, um, has replaced the Jews in the covenants and what they have because the Jews forfeited it. They rejected it, so uh, the, the church has replaced it. And so there's a lot of beliefs on that, and, that's, and that would kind of go into this model as well. Thomas Hooker and the Settlement of Connecticut. After enduring persecution from the Anglican Church in England, Hooker resolved to become a non-separating Congregationalist. The NC Church's polity distributed power throughout the people. And so pulling away from the Anglican Church or the Church of England, what we see is that the, the power was actually given to the people instead of a hierarchical type of mindset there. William Penn, Roger Williams, and the concept of the separation of the state from the church. Penn is also known as the founder of Pennsylvania and the proponent of religious freedom. Uh, of course, big proponent of the Quakers and those who believed in what's the inner light. They didn't have pastors that went to school. They actually believed that God just spoke through people and to people. And so... Um, uh, that's more of that mindset. And then Williams, Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island, as well as the founder of the First Baptist Church of America. This church was started in Providence, Rhode Island in 1638. And, um, and then it became this church, which is pretty incredible. First Baptist Church of America. And this church was erected in 1774. It's known as the First Baptist Meeting House. <laughs> You've heard of people saying having a camp meeting. Well, there's a meeting house. Church started in Roger Williams' home. Um, that's important to see how he was, um, how it started like churches start today a lot of times in somebody's home, and then it grew and they began to build. Started as a Calvinist church, then quickly became Arminian. Over 100 years later, it becomes a Calvinistic church again. And um, it's just amazing the history of this First Baptist Church. Uh, a couple of few hundred years of history, and it's uh, still, of course, standing today, and you can actually go see it. Um, the 18th century and the acceleration toward personal freedom, Jonathan Edwards and the First Great Awakening. Um, Jonathan Edwards was an American revivalist preacher, um, known many in many ways by reading his sermons. I don't know if you've heard that before, but a lot of times he would just have camp by candlelight and he would just read his sermons. There wouldn't be a lot of, uh, of emotion. Um, it was an extemporaneous type of preaching type thing. He was just reading it, but it was so strong and he really called on the Holy Spirit to just work in the lives of people. It brought forth such a, a huge awakening in America and of course Britain as well. Congregationalists Protestant theologian who espoused Reformed theology, and so he was, um, I, you could say, Calvinistic in his theology, or Reformed in his theology. The Great Awakening, revival in America, he was um, the one who really started this, not only him, but also a guy by the name of John Wesley and George Whitfield. These people might have even been different in their theology, but they were a huge, huge, a huge part of the Great Awakening, and they brought the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ um, to the world in an incredible way. And people quickly uh, began to respond. And they started to see that this was for them, that the, the gospel of Jesus Christ was for them. And, and of course, people began to get saved and converted. And, and next thing you know, it just spread like wildfire in such an incredible way. One of the most important works that he has given us was the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, um, a very powerful sermon that very that does a great job representing Jonathan Edwards and, um, and what he preached and how he preached and calling people to really understand there is a place, a real place called hell, and you don't want to go there. Um, as we move on, Arminianism, church membership, and the freedom of conscience. Arminianism. Jacob Arminius, who lived from 1560 to 1609, was the student of John Calvin's successor. Theodore Beza was his name. He held the belief that man had the freedom to reject God's grace or yield to it. 
Arminianism has become a huge buzzword today um, because of Calvinism, Reformed theology. And people say this, they say, okay, you're either an Arminian or you're a, a Calvinist. And a lot of that teaching is coming from um, just headline theology. It's not really looking into the depths of what these guys said, what they really believed. Uh, Arminianism today is different than classical Arminianism put out by what we by Jacob Arminius. It's it's just different in that nature. Calvinism during the time of Calvin is very different than Calvinism of today, or modern Calvinism. And actually, they, people have changed it to, now it's New Calvinism or Neo-Calvinism, Neo-Puritanism, those types of things. There's a lot of differences when you span over hundreds of years of history. And so these issues were huge at the time of the Great Awakening, at the time of the founding of America. This stuff was so fresh and new. People were grabbing onto anything they could get a hold of. Now we're overwhelmed with uh, books and doctrines and, and teachings, creeds, all this stuff. So we can actually form our, our beliefs. Uh, but I think when we start attaching ourselves to whether we are, um, whether we are, we come under the Arminian mindset or we come under the Calvinistic mindset, I think we find ourselves attaching, being attached to something that is hard to define sometimes. It's like nailing jello to the wall. What kind of Calvinist are you? Or what kind of Arminian are you? You hear people talk about that as well. And so when we define ourselves or we label ourselves, I think you got to be very careful making sure that if you do, if you're going to say you're under one of these belief systems, um, you got to understand that it's, uh, that's a, it's a big deal to define exactly what that means. Also going for, forward, we see church membership. The halfway covenant was a big part of church membership. The halfway covenant allowed congregants who were baptized as infants without a conversion experience to participate in the politics of the church, but could not take communion, vote, or have office. And so that's one of the things that we gotta you gotta consider there um, is is the church membership that they were in, allowing. And actually, Jonathan Edwards's grandfather Solomon Stoddard was the person who started that. Then freedom of conscience and the power of the Holy Spirit. Jonathan Edwards talked a lot about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in conscience in our lives and how we respond to all those types of things. And so there was a freedom that people felt that they could live out a certain way. And it wasn't just based on the hierarchy of a church, but actually based on the fact that I am an individual in the kingdom of God that God is working through. And not only can that take place in the kingdom of God, but it can also take place in civil government as well. All right. Well, it's so good to be with you today. This has been Religion of the Public Square. Um, continue on in your reading, and we'll talk with you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.